Ninjas are awesome. If you ever need to make a story better, add ninjas. If you ever need to prove a character is a certified tough guy, make them a ninja. If you ever need an excuse to make a character able to do something that shouldn't be possible, it's because they know a secret ninja technique. Make them a ninja. Logic dictates then that if you want a really awesome role-playing game, make it all about ninjas. And that's what we have today with Shinobigami. Shinobigami is a game about modern-day ninja battles. If ninjas were people with superhuman abilities and techniques and could move at superhuman speeds. This game is also unique in that it's explicitly meant to be a game where the other players are your antagonists. Shinobigami happens to be a part of the Saikoro Fiction line by Adventure Planning Service, which includes numerous other games with various other different genres, settings, and themes. Other sci-fi titles include Magicologia, about immortal wizards hunting down haunted books, Challenge Girls, Beginning Idol, which is basically Love Live or Idol Master, the role-playing game, Yonki vs. Yog sothoth about Japanese street punks beating up otherworldly horrors from the Cthulhu mythos, among numerous others. However, as of the writing of this script, Shinobagami is the only one with an official English translation and publication. But that's fine. Because if this does well, then by the power of ninjas, others may wind up getting published in English. Okay, that's a bit of wishful thinking. But with that said, let's go ahead and jump right into what it is that I do best. Explaining the game's mechanics. Let's start with character creation. The first step is to pick the ninja clan that your character belongs to. There are a total of six clans. Starting from the top, we have the Hirasaka Agency, dedicated to protecting Japan's national interests from threats both mundane and supernatural. Following that, we have the Otogi Private Academy, a boarding school that's secretly a training ground for young ninja. The Lost Ones, who are a clan in the sense that they don't have a clan, either because their clan was too small to matter, or they're the last of their clan or really any other reason they don't fit into the other clans. Next is the Hasuba Ninja Army, who are ninja that seek to turn all ninja arts into tools that everyone can use, in addition to uniting all the ninja clans. Then we have the Kurama Shin Clan, and they are dedicated to hunting down the supernatural. Specifically, they want to prevent the coming of the mysterious and titular Shinobigami. And last, we have the Bloodline of the Oni, supernatural creatures that have bound together out of a need to protect themselves from the suspicious and ever-violent humanity. The different clans all have their own agenda, and each one conflicts with some other clan more than others, as shown on this chart. After you've chosen your clan, there's a few story elements you can choose or roll on the table for. Your cover, which is what you appear to do in your mundane life, as well as your conviction, which is what your character stands for above all else. Each clan has their own chart for their cover and six entries, while the conviction chart has six entries on its own. Each clan also has a special category of skill that they do better than any other clan, and you get to pick three of these skills that your ninja has mastered. Circle them on your character sheet. Starting from the top with the Hirosaka Agency, scheming is their skill, the Otogi Private Academy specializes in strategy. The Lost Ones specialize in stealth. The Hasuba Ninja Army, technology. The Kurama Shin Clan, martial arts. And the Bloodline of the Oni have mastery over sorcery. Additionally, shade in the blanks on either side of your clan's specialty. The importance of this will be explained when I go over the game's mechanics. After you pick three skills from your clan's specialty, Pick three more skills from anywhere else on your skill matrix. They can be from any category, and they don't even need to be from all different categories. If you honestly felt like it, you could have six different skills in your special category. But that is a very risky maneuver. You'll also no doubt notice that there's 66 different skills in this game, 11 per category. 
The reason you don't want to cluster together too much is because you can use skills you don't have access to via this game's substitution mechanic. However, the further away the skill you're using is from the skill that you need, the more of a penalty you take. I explain more about substitution later, but for now, just keep in mind that spacing out your skills is usually an effective strategy. Once you have your skills, assign one of them to your close combat ninpo. Everyone gets close combat for free. Afterwards, you move on to picking four more ninpo. In general, you'll want at least one other attack ninpo, though the only real restrictions are that you must choose at least one from your clan's unique ninpo, while other clan-specific ninpo are off-limits. And there are three kinds of ninpo. Attack, that directly deal damage to other characters. Support, which trips up your opponents or helps you in other ways. And Equip, which are passive effects that you always have access to. Ninpo are where most of the rules in Shinobagami lie, since they're kind of like the spells or skills or abilities from some other game. And as you can expect, these are what grant you your really special ninja abilities. Many of them are combat-oriented, but plenty fulfill other purposes as well, such as one that allows you to wrap around the skill matrix, or to interpose yourself in any scene you're not supposed to be a part of, in true ninja fashion. And you are allowed to pick ninpo that you don't have the skill for, but you'll still be subject to the skill replacement penalty whenever you try to use it. Once you have your ninpo selected, you design your ogi, your ultimate technique. This comes in two steps, picking an effect from the list, and then describing how it works, including a chuny AF name that's as extra as your edgy little heart desires. There are seven effects for Ogi. However, if you're new to the game, it is highly recommended that you stick to either critical hit or area attack. Not only will this prevent the game from dragging on, but it'll give you another combat option as well. One final detail, and this is important. Do not tell the other players what your Ogi is. This is supposed to be kept a secret, and ninjas are all about keeping secrets. And with that, most of character creation is done. So let's move on to basic mechanics. For most roles, you're rolling 2d6 and trying to meet or beat a target number of 5. However, this is only if you have the skill in question. Given that there's a total of 66 skills, and you only have 6 of them, you're allowed to substitute for any skill you don't have for one that you do. The way this works is as follows. Find the skill that you need, and the skill that you have, and count the number of spaces between the two. For every space that you move, you add 1 to the target number. This includes the blank spaces between categories, but only if they're not shaded. So the blank columns you shaded in next to your clan's specialty, you're better at substituting with those than the other skills. The book has a very nice illustrated example that I'm going to reproduce here. Let's say you need the skill Bluff. If you have it, your target number is going to be 5. However, if you don't have it, and you want to use Performance instead, you raise the target number by 2 to make it a 7. The same is true for Ventriloquism, since the small, not shaded in space, also counts against you. At the start of a session, each player is given a mission and a secret. Sometimes, these will contradict one another. Other times, it may not be possible to accomplish both. These are your character's goals for the game, and ultimately, it's up to the player which they decide to pursue during the course of the game. Shinobagami thrives on internal conflict, as it does conflict between players. Though the key thing to remember is this, everybody's mission is public information, but secrets are kept private and cannot be willingly disclosed. Missions typically revolve around obtaining something referred to as a prize, which may or may not have in-game effects. Shinobagami is also played over three cycles, where each player is trying to unravel the mysteries of the scenario, in each cycle, each player takes turns being the lead character and taking steps to accomplish their mission. To this end, there's two kinds of scenes that a lead player can pick from, combat and drama, 
We'll go over drama first. If the lead player character chooses a drama scene, they decide when and where it is taking place, as well as who else would be present in the scene. As an aside, other players may elect that their character would not appear in a given drama scene, but they normally cannot appear unless the player leading the scene wants them in. Drama scenes are otherwise a brief scene where things happen between the characters present. At some point during the drama scene, the lead player has to decide what the intention of the scene was. And the three most common options are as follows. Recovery, forming emo bonds, and finding information. How the lead character accomplishes any of these is their choice. They pick one of their skills they feel is relevant, and if the GM approves, they roll for it. This is where the creative part of Shinobagami comes in. How do you justify using your necromancy skill to learn somebody's secret, or to make them love you? To go over the three options in more detail. Recovering represents recovering a life point or from a status effect that your character has. And quite simply, if you succeed on your skill roll, you regain that lost life point or recover from that status effect. Forming emo bonds can only be done with other characters appearing in the scene. If your skill roll is successful, both you and the other character roll 1d6 and consult the emo bond chart, and pick from either the corresponding positive or negative emotion. Emo bonds are important for numerous reasons. Anytime somebody that has an emo bond towards you directly learns something, you also learn that information. And when I say directly, I mean they can't have learned it from an emo bond themselves. This comic illustrates what I mean. This is called InfoShare. Furthermore, if somebody you have an emo bond with initiates or has a combat initiated against them, you can join in on that combat as well. And better still, if you have a positive emo bond towards somebody, once per drama scene or once per round in combat, you can give them a plus one to their roles. The opposite is true of a negative emo bond. You can give somebody you have a negative emo bond a minus one instead. And... Third, when making information checks, you choose which of two things you're trying to discover. A character's secret, which is key to figuring out what they might do, or their location, which is necessary to initiate a combat scene against them. And once you succeed on an information check, anybody you have an emo bond towards gains that information as well. As in most games, combat in Shinobagami has the most moving parts. First, in order to even initiate combat, you need to know that character's location by finding it in a drama scene. After you decide to initiate combat, anybody with an emo bond towards you or the target may jump in as well. Once all the people in combat has been determined, the lead character for the scene may decide upon the battlefield by either rolling or choosing an entry on the battlefield chart. The battlefield chart adds global modifiers to the battlefield, such as making it difficult for all characters in combat to dodge attacks made against them. Combat goes in three phases in Shinobagami. Plot, attack resolution, and end of round. Plot refers to everybody deciding on their plot value. Everybody takes a six-sided die, turns it over to the face they want their plot value to be, and reveals at the same time. Plot in Shinobagami is equal parts turn order, how many ninpo you can use, attack range, and your fumble value. When attacking, you may only use one attack ninpo per round. However, you may use as many ninpo as you like, so long as the cost of all your ninpo used that round do not exceed your plot value. For example, if you have a plot value of 5, you can use the ninpo meteor shower with a cost of 3 and still have room for another 2 cost worth of ninpo. The range of a ninpo is best explained using the velocity system chart. You place your die or a token on where your plot value is for the turn. The range of a ninpo is how many spaces away that you can hit from your plot value. Thus, if you're at plot value 4, close combat can only target someone that's on 3, 4, or 5. So, if you have a high enough plot to use an attack ninpo and your target is in range, you move on to seeing if your attack hits. Find the skill of the ninpo, and you'll be rolling against that with a base target number of 5. You can still use ninpo you don't have the skill for, but you will take penalties based on substitution. If you fail, the attack ends there. 
However, upon success, the defender may roll to dodge. They're rolling the same skill that you used for the Ninpo. So, to go back to Meteor Storm, you roll summoning at 5 if you have the skill. Anybody who wishes to avoid the attack must also roll summoning or substitute if they do not have it. This means that if Poisons is the closest skill they have, their target number increases by 4, meaning they need to get a 9 or higher to avoid getting caught in the Blast Wave. There's three damage types in Shinobigami, Close, Ranged, and Mob. Close and Ranged inflict life point damage. Characters normally have 6 life points, one associated with each skill category. If you lose a life point for a given skill category, you lose access to all the skills in that category. And if you take close combat damage, you randomly determine what the damage of the category goes to. Ranged combat, by contrast, is assigned to categories by the person taking the damage. This makes ranged damage slightly weaker than close combat, but still inhibiting. Mob combat, on the other hand, inflicts random status ailments, determined by the status ailment table. Any character that takes life point damage during a combat is knocked out of the scene, no longer able to act, and no longer targetable. At the end of the round, anybody still in the combat scene may opt to leave. Then, if the total number of rounds that has completed so far is equal to the number of participants that were involved, combat ends. If there's only one person or nobody left standing, that also triggers the end of combat. The last one standing gets to collect the spoils, and they pick one of the following things that they can take from a defeated character. Information, which is learning their secret or location, which is the winner picks an emo bond that that character must now have towards them. And if they already have one, it's overwritten with the new one. Moreover, this emo bond doesn't have to be from one of the 12 on the emo bond table. And prize. If the target has a prize item, they can take that prize for themselves. However, if there's nobody left standing, or there's two or more left when the combat completely ends, no spoils are claimed. After three cycles, where everybody gets a chance to run drama and combat scenes, the game culminates in a giant battle that all remaining player characters participate in. This is still a combat scene, but there's a few exceptions. Characters are only knocked out if they lose all of their life points, as opposed to just one. The GM may decide on an appropriate ending scenario for the climax, as opposed to the endings being just one person remaining, or the combat going on for too long. And the last mechanic I want to discuss is using Ogi. As long as the timing is appropriate for the Ogi effect you have, you can use your Ogi whenever you want. For example, you can use your critical hit Ogi in the middle of a combat, but not during a drama scene. And you can use it before the climax if you want. However, anybody involved in the scene that witnesses your Ogi learns it, and the next time you try to use it, they can attempt an Ogi break to stop it. To perform an Ogi break, you roll against the assigned skill of the Ogi, and if you succeed, the Ogi doesn't work. In other words, your Ogi is guaranteed to work at least once, but from that point forward, someone is going to know how to stop it. So. With the mechanics taken care of, I want to spend a little bit of time on some of the cultural aspects of Shinobigami. I've had the privilege of reading what somebody from Japan has had to say about Shinobigami, and even though the translators took extra care to be as faithful as they could, there's a lot of things that just get lost in translation, partially because of how the English language works. Let's take for example the kanji used to spell the bloodline of the Oni, it could also mean the bloodline of resistance. The story behind the bloodline of the Oni was that they wanted to create an equitable world for supernatural beings. Supernatural beings that were hunted down simply for not being human. If we look at the first Jukugo in their name, it has the meaning of endurance or resistance. But, because most kanji have two different ways of being pronounced in Japanese, this one can be read as Oni, even though it doesn't mean Oni. Furthermore, the second kanji in this Jukugo also means ninja, just for that added spice. Consequently, the Kurama Shin clan have the bloodline of the Oni as their favorite enemy. Kurama is also the name of a mountain near Kyoto, 
where the Kurama Tengu are believed to live. The most powerful of these Tengu is Sojobo, and he was the one who taught the legendary swordmaster Minamamoto no Yoshitsune swordsmanship, magic, and tactics. Furthermore, Kyoto is also believed to be a hotbed of demons and evil magic, on account of the constant political turmoil it's had throughout Japan's history. However, legends go that there's a powerful omyoji, or sorcerer, named Abe no Seimei whose spirit resides in a shrine dedicated to him in Kyoto, the Seimei Shrine. And, for that reason, a lot of the Kurama Shin Clan's clan-specific ninpo are named after other omyoji sorcerers. Those are just some of the details about the clans in Shinobagami. A lot of this is cultural things that, unless you're already very familiar with Japanese history, mythology, and also have access to the original text, would be a little difficult to make connections between. One aspect that was kept intact from the Japanese translation, however, was the format that the book takes. Most RPGs from Japan include what is known as a replay in the beginning. This is a transcript of a game that has been played before. These are equal parts fiction that people will read for enjoyment, as well as examples of how to play and run the game. Replays vary in length, and sometimes you can even find volumes of just nothing but replays of a given game. In the case of Shinobagami, though, this is about half the length of the core book, with the back half of the book being the rules that you need to actually play. So, for anybody curious about how a game of Shinobagami goes, you only need to read the first half of the book to get a good idea. Now, for the burning question. Is Shinobagami worth getting into? My answer is, a thousand times, yes. Yes, it is. Shinobagami is a game that really takes the style of tabletop role-playing games in a delightfully unusual direction. It has a narrow scope, but it plays wonderfully to the strength that this narrow scope grants it. It's easy to learn, has a lot of replayability, and is designed in such a way that you don't have to commit to the game for years to experience everything that it has to offer. Plus, it's an easy read, so you won't have a steep learning curve to worry about when you want to get into it. There's also a great deal of other games with similar mechanics but wildly different premises than Shinobagami that take advantage of the quick, narrative-focused but still mechanical aspect of Saikoro fiction. The last part makes Shinobagami a window into a whole new world of how role-playing games can be played and designed. And, above all else, it's a great exercise in role-playing, since there's a lot of strange happenstances that you'll need to come up with justifications for. Such as, how can climbing be used in exchange for disguises, or cooking in place of necromancy? Thanks for watching. If you found this video interesting or helpful, give me a thumbs up like. And if you want to learn more about role-playing games from Japan, click subscribe, or check out some of my other videos about Japanese role-playing games. With all that said, I am Aron Derashedo, and I will see you all next time.